Okay, I think we'll we'll get started if that's okay. Okay, good afternoon and welcome to the sixth in our series of land talks, jointly organised by the Housing Agency, the Land Development Agency, and the Geary Institute uh, of Public Policy in UCD. My name is David Silk, and I'm Director of Insights and Administration here in the Housing Agency, and it's my pleasure to chair today. In earlier sessions, we have looked at why governments intervene in land markets, public land banks, public land leasing, land pooling, and land value capture. So if you've missed any of those, housingagency.ie. Today, we'll focus on land value tax. And to start, we'll have a presentation by Dr. Fabian Weiner, who's joining us from Munich, Germany. And this will be followed by Dr. Ronan Lyons from Trinity College, Dublin. Uh, Dr. Weiner is research and teaching associate at the Chair of Urban Development at Technical University of Munich and head of the research group, Land Use Infrastructure Spatial Transformation. His research focuses is on integrated transport and urban development, land policy and digitalization in urban planning. As Dr. Weiner is getting ready to speak, just a reminder that you can submit any comments or questions to the Q&A uh, at the bottom of your screen, and we'll get to them after the presentations. So over to you, Dr. Weiner. Great. Thank you very much um, for that introduction. Uh, I feel very honored. Uh, to have been invited to talk about land policy with you today and um, also as a researcher who has worked on international examples of the land value tax uh, previously to report a bit on the current developments in Europe uh, regarding this topic. So this lecture series is extremely timely, I, I find. Um, as a researcher, I, I, I get the impression that land policy is really coming back on the agenda in a lot of European countries at the moment. Um, and um yeah it's uh, because housing issues become more pressing in, in a lot of countries and it's really important to think about land policy um at this point um, because in a lot of cases or many people tend to think that uh, it's actually planning that determines how our built environment uh, develops and looks but very often it's the, the framework conditions, the legal and also the financial framework conditions that structure uh, our built environment uh, at least as much. So it's really important to think about these, uh, these land policy instruments uh, and particularly about uh, taxation, even though my, some might consider that a bit uh, a boring topic, but it's really influential and it's important um, because it sets incentives and disincentives for the landowners to use their land in a certain way. Um, so I'm glad to uh, be able to talk about the land value tax a bit today. Um, and let's start right away. <laughs> um, so when talking about um, real estate taxation, we can differentiate um, se several types um, within that uh, group of, of taxes. Uh, particularly, we can differentiate by frequency of the taxation, either it's a tax might be non-recurring, uh, very often um, that the tax is then levied at uh, purchase or when a certain value increase occurs, that is, uh, for example, the stamp duty, uh, or the tax can be recurring, typically annual, um, and that is the case with most of the property taxes uh, throughout Europe. Um, then we can differentiate by what is actually taxed, the building, the land, or a combination of the two. And we can also um, differentiate um, by how the, the value of that text ob object is assessed, uh, whether it's about the monetary value or simply the size or other criteria. Um, and there are, of course, more uh, differentiations, but these are the most important ones, particularly when it comes to the land value tax, which is a recurring tax typically, so an, an, typically an annual tax on the monetary value of the land um, of, of a certain uh, real estate object. So on the plot value only without consideration of buildings or other improvements. Um, and I will abbreviate uh, land value taxes LVT on the following slides. Um, so 
one could say now, okay, um, it's just uh, um, another form of tax. What makes it so special? Well, there are several um, characteristics that uh, make it really exceptional. Um, first, on the on the economic side, and um, probably Ronan, as an economist, will be able to explain this much better than I could. Uh, but um, in economic terms, at least theoretically. Uh, a land value tax does not distort market supply as other taxes. Um, with a lot of other taxes, uh, the problem exists that the tax object becomes um, yeah, more expensive and at the same time the supply is reduced. For example, when a, a building is taxed, um, for example, uh, based on the floor size, then landowners will tend to build smaller and less buildings in order to avoid the tax. This cannot happen with the land value tax as the supply is fixed and the um, uh, the tax burden falls entirely on the landowners. So and there's uh, theoretically no, no debt rate loss, no welfare loss um, as the, the tax is entirely absorbed um, by the producer rent. Um, so the, these characteristics um, make it really um, special. There are a few other uh, objects that that have similar characteristics, um, and because of that, it has been endorsed by many uh, economists from all uh, times, so to say, uh, classical economists, contemporary economists, and the most prominent is probably Henry George, um, who has um, advocated this tax at the end of the. Uh, 19th century um, and even proposed it could be a single tax, meaning that all other taxes could be abolished uh, and the state um, revenues could be entirely generated by having a land value tax only. Um, so that was a very influential idea at the time. Um, but apart from the economical advantages, and this is probably uh, when it becomes uh, most interesting, um, is that the tax could potentially have uh, benefits for sustainable urban development. The land value is determined not by the actual current use of a land, but by the potential use the land could have. And that means that two identical neighboring plots of land uh, on which both the, the same development is theoretically possible, um, both of these plots would carry the same tax in the land value tax system. Um, so the, the tax is based on the, on, the, on the maximum allowed potential use. Um, and because of that, theoretically, it should incentivize landowners to exploit the development potentials because the tax yeah, exerts a, a gentle pressure on them to um, actually uh, do something productive with the land instead of leaving it vacant or idle. Um, and this then has ecological and social advantages. Um, ecological um, is, is uh, pretty clear. Um, this should incentivize infill housing, intensification, and in turn, reduction of the pressure on, on greenfield development and sprawl. And on the social side, um, one could say it increases housing supply in the long run, and it contributes to recapturing value increases from public investment. For example, if there's a public infrastructure created nearby, a new trans transit line, uh, then the land values will rise in that area. And the land value tax will then uh, serve to capture part of these value gains back for the public purse. Um, so it also discourages a bit uh, speculative land holding. Of course, if that becomes more expensive to uh, keep a vacant land plot for a long time, then landowners might uh, yeah, make different decisions with regard to uh, building on that land. Um, so does it lead to a more affordable housing uh, in the end? Well, not necessarily, one has to say. It increases housing supply in general uh, without consideration of affordability. Um, following the, the conventional trickle-down logic, 
uh, a larger housing supply should in the end benefit all uh, population groups more or less. Um, um, if the aim is actually to ensure that affordable housing is uh, is created, um, then additional instrument from the, from the land policy toolbox must be applied in addition, for example, developer applications. And land value tax also does not prevent increases of rent and purchase prices in general. However, it ensures that a, a part of that um, these increases are actually recaptured for the public purse. The benefit in the end depends a lot on what this uh, the, the, the tax revenues are actually spent on. If they are then used to subsidize affordable housing, then of course the, the tax can have a, um, an effect also with, with regard to this. So, and because of these uh, characteristics, uh, land value taxation has um, finds a lot of uh, advocates also in the areas of built environment professionals, um, in ecologists, uh, and so on. Um, and we will see later that um, this coalition also has led to um, the implementation of land value tax in one uh, case recently. Yeah, if, if these characteristics are uh, so uh, beneficial, at least in, in theory, then land value tax should be uh, applied in a lot of countries across the world, uh, one could think. But in fact, um, relatively few countries uh, so far implemented. Um, that has partly to do with uh, the fact that property taxation exists in a lot of countries for a long time already and to change anything regarding to it is of course um, politically a, a difficult topic um, as there are always burden shifts uh, and some groups will always be disadvantaged in case of the land value tax uh, a disadvantaged group would of course those um, be with a um, yeah with vacant uh, lots in, in in inner cities um, they would have to pay a much higher uh, tax than before. Um, yeah, some um, countries actually use it um, ex uh, exclusively. Uh, the most well known examples are Taiwan and Estonia. And from 2025, there will also be one federal state uh, in Germany that will implement the land value tax. Yeah, um, a bit of a background tip for that. The current property taxation system in Germany is, uh, as in many other countries, one that taxes land and buildings together. The last assessment was uh, that might be a bit shocking in some parts of the country in, in 1935 already. And the tax is still based on these values. And um, it should not uh, come as a surprise that the Constitutional Court uh, declared this as unconstitutional already five years ago. So the tax had to be reformed and the reform was also uh, um, passed by parliament and the new tax will also be on both land and buildings. Um, however, and this is the, um, the exciting new um, element, particularly uh, uh, for research on the effects of the tax, there is now an escape clause for uh, the federal states. Um, as you might know, Germany is, as a federal country, uh, um, yeah, is, is, is the federal states have a lot of uh, political power. And in this case, they negotiated an escape clause so that they can um, um, yeah, apply their own property tax and can deviate from the, from the federal model. And seven of the 16 states actually chose to do so. And one of them will introduce a land value tax. And that is Baden-Württemberg. Uh, that state is located in the Southwest. Um, Actually, the slide should move on to the next one now. Yeah, okay, now it did. Um, here, um, yeah, and uh, it, it takes some time still for the tax authorities to gather all the necessary data, which is why it will only be in effect from 2025. But this is, of course, um, now an exciting laboratory case also for um, urban development research because. Um, the effects might be observable in the years afterwards, uh, whether that actually uh, takes place, what theoretically 
and this the, the, the tax should have um, on effects on the built environment. The neighboring state, by the way, Bayern here, this is where I am located, shows a radically different model, um, a size-based only tax, um, where the tax is based only on the floor space uh, and the area of the land plot. So two similar uh, houses, one in the city center, one at the outskirts of the city, both completely identical. Um, but with different values, of course, will carry the same tax in the end. And one could, of course, ask oneself whether that is uh, actually too simple and uh, does not take into account the social factors enough. Yeah, how will that actually work? Uh, of course, it's crucial for land value tax how the values are actually um, arrived at um, and in the case uh, of the land value tax in Germany it will be determined by independent committees of valuation experts um, which are not a new institution they exist for uh, decades already uh, and the values they um, uh, yeah, publish are used for expropriation cases already for example and other other purposes and now they uh, will also be uh, used for determining the tax base in, in the case of Baden-Württemberg. Um, and they, these committees receive um, uh, copies of all land purchases, of all real estate purchases and transactions in, in the area. And through mathematical uh, methods, they determine the, the land component for different zones within the municipalities. And on these values, then uh, a tax rate is applied, and then the municipalities can set individual local multipliers. So, and it's maybe it's interesting as a background how this um, uh, land value tax in the state came about. It was really intensive lobbying, as I said, by an alliance of environmentalist groups, professional bodies of architects and planners, mayors, tenants associations, so a grant coalition. Uh, also a rare coalition of, of liberal, uh, labor and green political uh, um, um, lobby groups that um, found a common uh, ground in, in this land value tax and that in the end uh, was successful in this case. And also these urban development advantages were widely discussed during the parliamentary process. Uh, so it was not only about how to reform the tax and generate re revenue. It was also about uh, these, explicitly about these um, urban development uh, advantages. So before I um, uh, come to an end and wrap up, uh, let me briefly um, talk about the requirements and the yeah, criticism and um, uh, limitations of the land value tax. The first, uh, of course, uh, what's necessary is a functioning land register that uh, associates land with owners. Um, otherwise, the tax cannot be administered. But then also, um, what is really crucial is independent and accurate value assessment. In the case of Germany, um, these independent commissions of valuation experts um, were chosen to be the, uh, yeah, the instrument, how to arrive at the, at the value assessment, but one could also imagine to have um, a self-assessment by owners, um, which is, for example, the method that is used in Taiwan, and as far as I know, also uh, for the current property tax in Ireland. Um, this is also, of course, uh, one way to, to arrive at these uh, values. Then, of course, the question is how to uh, avoid um, the fallacy that uh, landowners might uh, set their land values too low. Uh, one could maybe um, prevent this by uh, using these values also for ex expropriation cases, which is precisely what Taiwan does. Um, and then it's important to have regular reassessment, of course, because the longer you wait with reassessment, uh, the more difficult it becomes politically because the values, of course, um, generally increase over time. And at some point, uh, 
uh, it might be politically no longer opportune to have a reassessment and it's then indefinitely postponed. This is also what, something that can be observed in a lot of cases in practice, actually. So, yeah. And also to, yeah, to, to have these urban development effects, maybe two more factors are really important. One is um, that the tax rate has, of course, to be high enough to uh, incentivize landowners in a meaningful way. Um, it can be, for example, in the case of Estonia, uh, the tax values were actually, uh, the tax rate in the end was very low, so that uh, even though land value tax was in place, it did not really influence the owners. Um, and, and this is another, yeah, maybe not limitation, but it, the land value tax functions particularly well with the zoning-based urban planning system, as can be found in continental Europe mostly. Um, because there, for every plot of land, at every time, it is clear um, what the maximum allowed use is. In a discretionary zoning system, um, it's not impossible to implement the land value tax, but of course, it, 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 a lot more assumptions have to be made and it becomes a bit more uh, difficult. Yeah, um, criticisms uh, exist, of course, as well. Um, one angle is the, the value assessment method. Um, that, 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 yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, crucial to really um, document that the value assessment is accurate and fair and independent. Um, there's a group of, of uh, households that might be overburdened in, when the tax is introduced. Um, high asset, low income uh, household is the is the, the, the name for that phenomenon. So um, as an example, the elderly pensioner living alone in a very large villa in the urban center that might suddenly now be uh, faced, facing a, a very high tax that uh, was not uh, in place before. But uh, proponents of the land value tax would argue that this is precisely what the tax uh, is intended for because this this use of land represents a an, um, yeah a, a waste of a scarce resource that is urban buildable land. So this might be a, a case for uh, hardship uh, transitionary regulations to avoid this. And there are also some authors that argue it can lead to premature development with too low density as the city expands because urban structures are so durable. And uh, um, as the city expands, um, landowners might be incentivized to build too early, in fact. Yeah, this is um, my uh, short introduction to the land value tax. Um, I also added some references here for further reading, in case you're interested. And uh, thank you for your attention. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Viner. Um, and um, just a reminder, I see there's two questions coming in there in our Q&A, which uh, I'd encourage more people to bring more questions in, and we'll uh, have uh, time for discussion after our second speaker. Uh, and also just a reminder that our uh, presentations will be up on our YouTube channel later on, and the uh, slides themselves will be available on the website. Uh, so now just to introduce Dr. Ronan Lyons, uh, Ronan is Associate Professor in Economics at Trinity College Dublin, where his primary research areas are housing markets, urban economics, and economic history. He's also a research associate at the Spatial Economic Research Centre in the London School of Economics, and author of DAF.ie reports on Ireland's uh, sale and rental markets. He's an active contributor to the policy debate on housing in Ireland with many articles published in national media and is a familiar, familiar commentator to many of us. So thank you, Dr. Lyons. Thank you very much, David, for the introduction. And, and uh, thank you also to, to Fabian for a, a really interesting presentation of the, the system that's emerging in, in Germany. I see a few people who are attending today who um, have been with me in the trenches in relation to land value tax over the, the last decade or so. And um, uh, uh, what I, I think 
for background, and of course, many of you will know this, uh, about 10 years ago or a little over 10 years ago, Ireland had no annual property tax and there was a discussion um, at the time um, as to what um, uh, as to what uh, tax should be introduced because it was uh, included as a recommendation in the report from the, the so-called Troika, the European Commission and, and the IMF in particular, um, that Ireland introduce a, an annual um, property tax. And it, it, I think the report it specifically recommended a site or land value tax. And that was um, one, of the, uh, one of the few recommendations, um, I think, that, that actually was not implemented um, before the, the Troika finished up their, um, their, their work in Ireland. Um, so today I wanted to go through a little bit um, of, of some of the themes that, that Fabian um, talked about but with respect to the Irish case. I'll talk a little bit about Northern Ireland at the end, but, but principally about, about Ireland. Um, Fabian mentioned that this is something that um, has a, uh, an unusual coalition uh, behind it. And it, it was the case in, in, in Germany. It was interesting to read um, in, in Baden-Württemberg the, the, the various groups that were, that were in favour, um, not always uh, regarded as, as, as bedfellows politically, um, but um, more or less, if you're, if you're not a centrist, right, if you're, if you're not a status quo person, you might be interested in a land value tax. Um, there's a, a sort of a, strain, a strand of, of thinking that's right of centre that would, would argue strongly in favour of land value tax. Um, and indeed, there's a, um, a strand of thinking that's left of centre and in particular ecological um, uh, that would, would also advocate for, for land value tax. And um, not quite 15 years ago, but not far off, in a major review of, of taxation in the UK, um, the Mere Lease Review, um, it was pretty clear on um, land value tax, but uh, as you can see, it asked more, <laughs> asked more questions than it could answer. The economic case for land value tax is simple and almost undeniable. Why then do we not have one already? Why indeed is the possibility of such a tax barely part of the mainstream political debate with proponents considered marginal and unconventional? Well, I, I, I might say that I don't consider myself marginal or and unconventional, but um, other than that, um, uh, I, I think it's a fair assessment. And I would go a little bit further than Fabian. Fabian mentioned that I mean, the importance of persistence when thinking about taxation systems in general and property um, and tax in particular. And the best system for any politician to have to introduce this year is the one that they had last year. Just roll it over um, because people have a status quo bias. Um, nobody really complains about the VAT rate, but if you, were if you were to try and introduce a new tax equivalent to VAT next year, everyone would be aghast at the idea of 20% or 23% or whatever um, uh, tax being being put on. Um, and that's the case um, in, in, in Ireland and indeed um, more famously with or infamously with, with water charges. Um, so again, in particular for Fabian's background, there are no charges for water usage, um, residential water usage in Ireland. And that was another recommendation um, uh, as, as part of the, the, the Troika. Um, but maybe it was the sequencing, but property tax got through and uh, water charges did not, in large part because um, uh, of a, a public protest against what was seen as yet another charge. Are we not paying for this already through general taxation, etc.? I won't take any stand on, um, on, on water charges, although um, as, as an ecologically minded economist, it might be easy to figure out what my stance might be. I'll, I'll, I'll stick to the topic at hand um, and, uh, and consider um, land value tax. That was the, 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 the British re um, uh, review. Why do we not have one already? I think it's kind of interesting that many places um, there was a paper out recently talking about Henry George. Fabian mentioned Henry George, and I'll, I'll, I'll close with a little tribute to Henry George in my last slide. Um, uh, it, the, the paper recently argued effectively that until um, 1917 and the Russian Revolution, Henry George was the single biggest figure in left-wing thought, um, um, and then he was replaced effectively overnight by Karl Marx. That might be a slightly simple version, um, but I think it's useful to, to consider um, uh, Henry George was not just another obscure um, economist or theorist. Um, he um, ran for, for mayor of New York and, and, and died a few days before the campaign. Arguably, he may have won. Um, um, that um, he was a uh, his book I think was the third best selling book or second best selling book in the U.S. 
in the second half of the 19th century after the Bible, um, it, it, sort of a, a colossus of thought at the time, even though he's more obscure now. Um, and many places did introduce a land value tax, in particular in the West of North America, not just in the US, but in Canada as well. They set them up in the 1880s or 1890s into the 1900s, and one by one, they all got rid of them at some point. So I think it's useful to say it's not just the case that the best system you have is the one you have now because you don't want to introduce a new system but also there are places that have done this before and it's worth um, understanding why those places got rid of them in, in the past what were the coalitions um, that came together to say we need to move away from a land value tax and what was the reason for that and have those have those reasons changed and i will do a quick shout out for the lincoln institute of land policy which is based in um, cambridge massachusetts they work a lot on land value taxation um, uh, in sort of the spirit of their their, their founder, David Lincoln, um, uh, and they've supported some of my work looking at this over the last 10 years as well. So it's only fair that I give them a shout out. Um, that's the UK. And if you look at the Irish case, right, just a few months ago, the Commission on Taxation and Welfare in the, I have it on my desk here, Foundations for the Future report, um, they also considered um, the taxation of, of property and real estate, um, and they, they listed some implementation challenges, some potential drawbacks, um, but also the advantages of a system based on um, land value or site value, and in the whole, as they say, or in the round, um, concluded that the potential benefits of a simple, efficient and equitable tax based on site value outweighs the potential costs and implementation challenges. So um, in, in the case of Ireland, um, we have done this review, a Merlis style review more recently, and also come to the same conclusion. Um, so the question is, how, how would it work? How would it relate to the housing challenges that, that Ireland faces? Um, I'm going to consider after a bit of context, which I won't dwell on too long because many people are very familiar with it, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about economic considerations, administrative considerations and electoral considerations, which I think are all relevant here. And then I'll, I'll just close with what it, what it might look like um, in, in practice in terms of its effect. Um, so this is a graph um, that, that looks at the number of new homes built per year um, in, in Ireland. Um, over the last um, 70 years or so expressed per household. And I've split out Dublin and the rest of the country um, just for simplicity. Uh, and you can sort of see, um, if you look at around 1975, there's a, a kink in the Dublin curve. Since then, um, Dublin, and you can kind of think of Dublin here as a bit of a, a proxy for all the, the major cities, but Dublin has been building fewer homes um, than the rest of the country. Um, so, so in, in effect, the country has been de-urbanizing or, or urbanizing in a very different way um, uh, with, with significantly more sprawl um, than, um, than one might have chosen if we were to go back and, and do it all again. The, the little red lines at the end are my estimate of where we need to be in terms of, of new housing supply, somewhere between two and two and a half percent um, per year per household um, over the next uh, 30 to 40 years in order to get the kinds of um, uh, uh, the, the stock of dwellings that we need, given Ireland is relatively unusual in Europe for two reasons. The first is its population is still growing, um, driven in part by um, um, by a delayed um, slowdown in fertility, um, but but principally now by by net migration. Um, but also crucially, Ireland is transitioning from larger to smaller households about 30 to 40 years behind its European peers. So as you even with the same population, as you go from households of four to households of two, in, in that case, you need twice as many homes and the homes need to be different, but right? they need to be as if you're also urbanizing at the same time, you're going from rural larger houses effectively to smaller urban apartments, um, or, or at least the homes are smaller because they're, de they're dealing with, with smaller, smaller households. Um, but as, as the cities have been underbuilding, and you could do this graph for a few other countries that would look the same, um, maybe not as extreme, but the same idea, as this is not unique to Ireland, um, but but a, a premium has emerged for the, the, the price of a home in Dublin compared to rural Ireland, right? That premium did not exist in the 1970s. And arguably, you could say as, as recently as 1995, it didn't really exist, um, a premium for, for living in Dublin compared to elsewhere. It, the cost of building a home is the same. So the only thing that's driving that difference, sorry, it's the same perhaps with a few percentage points um, in the difference. The only thing that's driving that is land value. 
um, and land value is reflecting the scarcity of, of homes. Um, so it, you can do this, there's a, a really interesting paper by um, Katharina Nall and, and co-authors that's in the American Economic Review that looks at housing prices around the world for as far back as possible. And this same kind of pattern emerges that in the last 30, 50, 70 years, depending on, on where you're looking, um, we have seen larger cities under provide housing such that on, on a scale that has created artificial land value um, um, through scarcity of, of homes. So that's, that's the context for us. Um, how would it work? And, and Fabian mentioned a little bit about the, the economic um, considerations. Ultimately, it comes down to land is not, is, is not movable, right? So because it's not movable, it doesn't really have an outside option, right? If you own a bunch of shares in a company, you can try your best, employ the best accountants and lawyers and, and move them to Malta or are going to pick on anywhere, but move them somewhere. Um, other people might give Ireland in that example. So um, move them to some jurisdiction um, where, um, the burden of taxation is, is going to be lower. You cannot do that with land. Right? So, um, and it, it's also different from dwellings, right? Dwellings are immobile as well, um, but you can choose not to build a dwelling. If a site has value, you don't get to choose that the site doesn't have value and therefore avoid the tax. And that comes back to the very final point I wanted to make at the end, which is that the value of a site comes from um, uh, what is happening around the site, not from the site itself. And that includes... Um, obvious things um, uh, that may change the value overnight, like zoning and planning, but also less obvious things like natural amenities, um, neighborhood amenities, education, transport, employment, all of those things will affect the value of a site. And that's the, the second point, which is that land value tax internalizes those external factors. Right? So uh, if, if it were the case that you put in a new light rail, um, for example, there's a new light, newish light rail in Dublin going through the north of the city um, through to um, through to Cabra. By putting that in, you've changed the value of the land there, and you've changed the potential, the opportunity associated with that land. As it stands, the people who live there um, see an upswing in their in their property values, which is effectively an upswing in their land values. That's free wealth for them that society has paid for through the hard work of of building a light rail. And they estimate in the case of the Jubilee Line extension um, in, in London, that the upswing in land values was well above the, the cost of actually building. It's, but of course, that went to the landowners and the general tax um, payer had to pay for the, the in that case, the new, um, the new train lines. And when you think about land value tax that way, it's actually a way of generating revenues for things that are socially useful. Right. So if you have the Phoenix Park, so the, the, the big park in, in Dublin, um, that has a spillover effect, and the ESRI have, have looked at that as a spillover effect on the properties um, nearby. If you had a land value tax, some fraction um, of that land value is because of the park, and therefore those revenues can go to the park and the, the maintenance of the park because it is creating the value around. Um, I mentioned before, but our, our housing need is concentrated in, in homes for smaller households and in urban areas. And that's a very different way to how we built homes, say, in the 20th century. We had small, um, uh, sorry, we had, um, we had typically greenfield edge of city or beyond the city development um, where you're building estate houses. Um, that was what we did. And the land value of those was pretty small. As we... Um, look to converge effectively to, to our European peers living in cities and living typically in two or maybe three person households or one, two, three person households on the whole. And that will mean we will need to get very good at building apartments of all different forms, right? from student accommodation through to assisted living and the whole life cycle of, of, of urban housing. We need to get very good at over the coming decades, but we won't be able to do that if we're um, uh, spending 100,000 per home in urban land, per apartment home in urban land, because that will mean it's simply not viable. There is, of course, a separate issue right now with, with construction costs um, that we do need to resolve, but this is more of, think of this as the medium term. You can fix the construction costs and you still won't have solved um, a high land costs, in particular in, in Dublin. So that's how in theory, how in practice would you do it? Um, and I do remember the discussions 10 years ago and talking to people who were involved in the, um, uh, in, 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 I suppose, policy making and policy implementation back then. Um, and they're like, how would this even work? 
not knowing that Ireland had actually done this in the 1850s. And in the 1850s, Griffith's valuation, they went around, and there's an example there on the right of um, a townland in Galway that's on the Rundale system. Um, and they were able to describe the, the, the extent of the land. There's actually maps that back these up, the extent of the land, the value of the land, and therefore the tax um, due to be paid. Um, and they split, you can see they split between the land and, and the buildings there. Um, they were able to do this in the 1850s. It actually did take them a, a, quite a while. Um, and then the idea, and this is implemented across the UK as it was at, at the time, was that you update periodically. And Northern Ireland still has that system, effectively, and commercial property in Ireland still has the descendant of that system, the, the idea of rateable valuation. But there's some rate that you implement, and it it's ultimately comes down to the rental value of um of individual property and so fabian pointed out some of the um the requirements around information um most countries have these um you can go to most countries and they're able to tell you what the dwelling stock is in a particular city they might even be able to tell you the number of square meters or cubic meters um that they have in in their city in Ireland, we don't have that, um, similar to, to the UK, and for similar reasons, I think it's a, a sort of a common law versus civil law split, um, but we do not have a full cadaster. And we missed an opportunity here when setting up local property tax to get the information we need to, to manage our land better. What they could have done implementing local property tax for the first time is give people a tax credit um, for returning a a form with all the information um, that you would need to, to understand what you have, what housing and land you have. Um, again, most countries have this, um, uh, Ireland does not. And there was a further missed opportunity when we switched over, this is fixable, when we switched over from a priority-based system, um, this is sort of legal history, not particularly important, we moved to a, a, a title-based system. So priority means the state has no opinion on who owns what land. It's all about who has the best bundle of documents going to court. But a title-based system, as is common in, in most countries now, the state has an opinion. You can go to a map and the state will say, we believe um, this particular person or entity owns that land. Um, Ireland switched uh, or is switching over to a title-based system, but it is only doing so based on transactions. In other words, when you transact a, a, a plot of land that is not in the title-based system, you have to register it for title. And that's a good idea because over 10 years, you will get um, uh, quite a lot coming on to the title-based system. But what it will not capture is it will not capture um, empty or, or derelict land or sites or buildings. Um, and that's a, a failing because they might be the sites we're most interested in from an LVT perspective. Um, so again, that's fixable. Um, as for the, 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 the other information, we might have to do um, use a couple of tricks to get that. Um, there's a critical role here for a new organization called Talcha Aaron. Um, it's supposed to be a combination of Ordnance Survey Ireland, the Valuations Office, and the Land Register and Land Registry. Um, and um, combined, when you think about that, you've got the mapping. You've got the borders of, or, um, of, of sites, and you've got uh, um, the skill set to, to value things. And by bringing them together, they're all sort of spatial in some way, spatial in real estate and land. And by bringing them together, um, we should be able to implement a, uh, a land value tax on whatever chunk we want to do, and which was the last thing I wanted to talk about, how politically, well, the first one was how in theory, the second is how in practice, and the third is how in politics would you do this and get reelected? Um, you can think of that about different elements. Um, so um, one obvious place to start would be to replace commercial rates, the system we have now with a, a, a commercial land value tax. So anything that's um, commercial, industrial or similar. Um, but I, I would argue that if you're gonna do that, you absolutely have to include publicly owned land in all its definitions. Right, so you got you have to include the Office of the Public Works, um, the HSC and and CIE, as the the, the health and, and and transport agencies, but also the local authorities. They have to be included in order for us to understand who owns what and and who has the the most valuable but most underutilized sites. Um, I've included residential there optimistically, but I suspect that if a politician were going to do this, they would pick commercial, public, and development land, and they would leave residential and agricultural. Um, uh, it, for electoral reasons. I could live with that because I think the impact of land value tax on supply is going to be greatest on development land. 
um, and indeed commercial and public kind of mixed use land. And, and the LDA has been trying to do this, trying to sort of internally apply a land value tax model by looking at the most valuable sites and, and, and developing those, but you don't have to rely on an LDA per se if you have a land value tax. You're effectively forcing those signals out into the, into the public and letting um, the sector respond um, to, by internalizing those external costs and, and benefits. Um, but, but suppose we don't do residential, what you could do is you could tweak the return, right? So the residential return would include how much an estimate of your land value and an estimate of your structure value and say, here's what you would pay um, uh, under land value tax. But don't worry, we're going to stick with local property tax. The reason I say you might do that is because the majority would benefit from a land value tax if it were revenue neutral. Right, just keeping the amount of money you'd get from local property tax the same, but changing its basis, the burden of taxation would go disproportionately on the, the wealthiest in society. Right, so, so by making it visible, you might actually build support um, for, for land value tax. You could have revenue neutral, you could have revenue shifting. Right? So you choose to tax consumption and income less and land as a, the major form of wealth more. Or you could in, in, indeed have revenue raising. Right? There's, um, so you're actually trying to get more revenues um, in. What I would say, though, in practically speaking, is that you should start with land value literacy, as in making people aware of what their, um, their, their, their site is, is worth, and do a pilot. So pick Limerick or Waterford or Kilkenny or Sligo, implement it in that city or town, um, and show what it would look like, and see if people are happy with it and what issues arise. Uh, and some of those issues um, uh, Fabian mentioned say, you know, how do we want to handle somebody who has a really valuable site in the center of a town, um, but they've lived there for 50 years? I would argue no exemptions, you can have deferrals if you want. So you don't get to not pay the tax, you just get to pay the tax after you die, for example, as is, again is common in, in other settings. Um, about 10 years ago, I, I, I tried to estimate what land values look like in Ireland, and that's 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 um, that was the, the output. Those units are probably a little large for, for land, land values. You can see Dublin is, um, there are units there that are based on the census, um, uh, but you might want more gradients than just 10 land uh, value bands. You might want more like 50 or 100 um, in order to differentiate between even different parts of Dublin 4 as the most expensive part of, of Dublin. Irish Town and Rings End is going to be different to, to Bowles Bridge um, and the area around there. What might be last uh, last thing before I, 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 I wrap up, this is an exercise that myself and Andrew Whiteman, who's a, a, um, uh, a Scottish MSP now for the Green Party, um, uh, we, we used the rateable valuations um, for Northern Ireland to look at what would be the burden of a, um, uh, sorry, just we go back uh, one, I think, and what would be the burden of, um, of, of taxation, the change in the property tax bill. And you can see most of Northern Ireland, um, including quite a lot of Belfast, would have very little change in their property tax bill or indeed a smaller property tax bill by switching to land value tax. There's just a, a few areas that would pay significantly more. Um, and those are the areas where the wealthiest um, typically live. So this is my last slide, um, the uh, Henry George um, uh, quote there, or rather somebody channeling their Henry George. This is this, um, uh, 1930s, I think. I paid $3,600 for this lot and will hold till I get 6,000. The profit is unearned. Um, I take the profit without earning it for the remedy, read Henry George. So I do think that whether you're interested in taxing the wealthy, whether you're interested in taxing for sustainable development, or whether you're interested in um, uh, improving the property tax system in order to bring about more supply and make housing more affordable, I think land value tax is well worth considering. Um, and as I say, if I were doing it in Ireland, I would start with commercial, public and development and, uh, and, and build the groundwork for residential and agricultural. Thanks for listening. And I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Ronan and Fabian. Thank you too. Um, I'm conscious of time. We have about 10 minutes left for some questions and discussion, and we have some questions. So I'm going to go straight to them. And there's two questions uh, that have been posed, which are a little bit on the maybe unintended consequences of a land value tax coming at it from two different uh, perspectives. So I might pose both of those to start off with, and then we'll, we'll get to others. So uh, all land cannot be delivered at the same time. 
where only limited uh, construction capacity is available to deliver, won't the tax incentivize some sites and incrementally add costs to other sites or make them less viable? Um, and the second one then was uh, land taxes are based on the highest and best land use. In other words, the land use that can pay the highest price. This does not necessarily correspond to socially and in, in, ecologically desired land uses such as childcare, circular economy, etc. How would you prevent a land value tax from crowding out uh, these land uses and replacing them with more profitable ones? that can afford to pay the tax. So really it's about uh, land value tax, um, maybe adding to the cost of uh, construction in some areas, and maybe uh, encouraging developments that are high profit as opposed to socially um, beneficial. Uh, Fabian or Ronan, would you like to uh, comment on, on that? I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to, to make a couple of maybe local remarks and then, and then Fabian may have some uh, an international perspective. I think it depends on what you you imagine land value, how it's implemented. If it's another charge on top of stamp duties, VAT, um, development levies and so on, then it could certainly be a challenge to viability. Um, but realistically, what we have at the moment is a taxation system that is loaded on new development and existing real estate pays an awful lot less. Um, so if you think of, of homes that are built, I gave the example of the Lewis earlier on, think of the green line going through Ranla, old homes, high value, and they got their value boosted further by the Lewis. Who paid for it? Well, it was a, it was a planning application somewhere else that paid development levies um, that, that used to fund, among other things, um, the Lewis Light Rail. So it comes back to revenue neutral, revenue shifting um, or revenue raising. And my argument would be it's, it's, it's revenue neutral and maybe revenue shifting, right? You want to increase the burden of tax on wealth um, and, and land is the obvious place to start with that. That said, and I think it was Stefan um, raised the point about, it, you know, the, the, the best use may not be, the best market use and the best social use may be slightly different things. And I think here, it, it, and I, I, I didn't mention it in, in, in the talk, but it's absolutely critical that we understand the zoning and planning system and their combination. Uh, and, it, and effectively in Ireland, it's zoning, planning and legal system now, uh, the, the trio go together. Um, I don't think that's optimal. I think we should go back to a zoning system or go to a zoning system similar to maybe like the Danish master plan system um, where the long-term requirement is outlined and then it's taxed on that basis. Um, and that would include provision for childcare, for education facilities, uh, uh, for other things. Um, ultimately, the, the best use Right, there's two ways of reading this. The best use is the best use zone, um, allowed in zoning. You may say, well, practically what happens when somebody comes along and says, yeah, but actually it'd be really valuable if we had a hotel in this site rather than apartments. It's worth then, you can stick to the zoning plan, but it's worth wondering why the hotel is higher value. Mm -hmm. That's probably indicating a shortage of hotel space, um, which could feed through into the, sh the short term lets and have a, a negative impact in the in the in the in the long term rental market. Um, so so don't always give in to highest value uses in the market that are outside your zoning, but understand why they're cropping up. OK, and Fabian, when you're replying, you might uh, address this third question as well, which is um, how does land value tax encourage infill and increasing housing supply generally? Um, but um, maybe some of the unintended consequences of increasing costs or indeed uh, sort of pushing uh, developments in a particular direction as well, if you had any comments on those. Yes, yeah, my, my answer to that, um, to the question of Stefan, um, yeah, goes in the same direction. Um, of course, this um, the, the danger is real <laughs> that uh, maybe also ecologically valuable uh, um, 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 vacant or derelict uh, uh, lots in a built-up area uh, suddenly uh, are under pressure of, of, uh, of building and it, it um, increases also the, 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 res the responsibility of zoning um, to ensure that social and ecological uses uh, find space within the, um, the, the, the um, existing uh, urban fabric, um, so to say. So this is why there's a, there's a particularly well fit between between land value tax and zoning systems. Actually, so in uh, in a discretionary system, certainly there would have to be um, some um, 
way of also uh, determining beforehand which land generally should be uh, used for which purpose without uh, yeah being as detailed as as, as a zoning plan in, in some uh, zoning planning systems. And yeah, how how does uh, land value tax at least theoretically achieve this um, uh, this infill uh, infill housing and uh, increasing housing supply? Yeah, this is um, precisely through shifting the tax burden um, within the group of of landowners. For example, in the in the in the case of Germany, there have been uh, yeah simulations or uh, beforehand. Um, uh, calculations on the assumption that the overall revenue within a municipality uh, would remain uh, stable from the property tax. So with the revenue neutral, uh, the aim to remain revenue neutral. And the, the, the result was that the tax burden for um, uh, owners of empty but buildable land in an urban context would increase about five times uh, compared to the current situation. While for many other landowners, um, the tax burden would remain more or less the same or even uh, decline a bit. So it's it's a shift within the different uh, groups of landowners. And this should then increase the pressure to um, use urban land effectively, efficiently, um, and, and, and um, yeah, densify within existing context, indirectly reducing the the need to use greenfield land for new urban development. So it's, it's an indirect assumption um, to um, yeah how, how the tax can achieve this. Okay, and and while I have you, um, there's a question here from Katrina. Uh, in Ireland, there's no central register of land transaction prices. Is capturing this data a necessary first step towards a land value tax? Is this information captured in Germany? And if not, how did they implement the land value tax? Yes, exactly. Um, so what, what Ron also just uh, said, that, that system is, uh, is in place in Germany, a land cadastre or land register where for each and every plot um, it is uh, known to yeah, uh, the tax office who is the owner of that land. So um, it is um, rather easy to uh, then um, of course uh, also collect the tax. And um, yeah, the, the, this is what I said when I, um, Refer to these uh, valuation expert committees. Mm -hmm. This is um, precisely what happens there. Um, they receive a copy of every of every uh, transaction um, in the in the municipality, and then can indirectly um, determine the value of of land in certain zones within the within the municipality. And this is um, a useful um, step. Even though one could also, of course, uh, go for a, like a self-assessment uh, of landowners within certain bounds or certain limits, um, so it's it's not it's, it's not necessary in that sense, I would say, but um, it's certainly helpful. Okay. Okay. Thanks very much. Just before we finish up, Ronan, I'm going to come back to you and then to Fabian. Is there anything you'd like to respond to from the questions that have come in, or anything that you'd just like to? Um, say as a, a sort of final concluding comment um i, I think uh, john um has a um a point about discretionary zoning and, and i i do think we need to and the center for cities actually had a good kind of comparison of, of, of different zoning and planning systems we need to avoid being in the in, in a, an unusual intersection where we have both zoning and individual planning permissions because then that, that it becomes a lot harder to it becomes a lot harder to deliver housing. It's also a lot harder to understand then what the, the value of a, a an undeveloped site is if it's unclear if you would get permission, de facto permission um, to, to build something. But overall, I think a lot of, and even when it comes to, you know, do we need transactions? In principle, you don't even need self-assessments or transactions of land. You can work off the rental value and um, to estimate what the land value tax would be. Of course, 
more than one source would be helpful. So I certainly wouldn't argue against having a, a register of land transactions. In principle, though, we don't necessarily need it. It's uh, logistically a lot simpler than it was 10 or 15 years ago. Um, and for that reason, I'm even more of a fan now than I was 10 or 15 years ago. OK, very good. And Fabian, there's a question here from Noel Cahill in, in NESC. Uh, is the uh, tax rate high enough in Germany? Yes, very interesting question. Um, it still remains to be seen, I would say, uh, um, because the municipalities did not uh, set their individual uh, multipliers yet, and they can they can double, triple uh, the tax if uh, if, if they want, um, and they uh, there's there's no no uh, decision on that yet. But generally, I would tend to say uh, yes. Uh, could be high enough. Certainly, it will be a, a lot higher than uh, in the Estonian case, which is the only one that has been uh, empirically researched a bit uh, more so far. So, yeah, um, I'm a bit more confident that this could uh, yield to some results also on urban development. Okay. Uh, I don't know if we have time for this last question about community land trusts, Ronan. Um, I don't know if you had a chance to have a look at that from Emer. Um, just is that a potential solution? Yeah, I mean, I, I, um, I, I certainly again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't rule it out. I think it's a, it's an interesting model. I don't think it's going to be a silver bullet per se, but it can definitely help in in particular areas, um, more, or more generally, enabling people to share in the uplift in land values as well, um, in in whatever way that that takes place, is is a way to get the a, a buy in from from local residents. Um, in particular, um, as those most affected by, by new development. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Ronan, and thanks, Fabian. I'm, I'm conscious that we're now a minute over time, uh, which uh, is just about acceptable, but uh, we can't go two minutes over time. Uh, <laughs> so just a reminder that the, the seventh and final session in the series takes place on Tuesday the 7th of February from 12 to 1, and the topic will be inclusionary zoning and details of that are on our website, and please do register for that. Thanks to our speakers, uh, Fabian and Ronan. Thank you very much for a very interesting hour. Uh, and to the Land Development Agency and the Geary Institute for co-hosting this series. Uh, finally, a thanks to Sarah Walsh and Tara Doyle for their help in organising it. And a final reminder that you can get the information, the recordings, the slides and so on, on our website, housingagency.ie, in the news and events section. So. Uh, Thank you very much, and I hope you have a, an enjoyable uh, lunch break now. Okay, thank you, Fabian. Thanks, Ronan.